let's address a few of these topics because I think people are legitimately confused and you guys are so deep in the research and excellent at understanding and, and interpreting and making it easy for us to understand. People continue to cite the Mediterranean diet and the research done on that as a reason to consume fish. And they also tie this into the logic of, oh, because the brain is made of fat, we should also have, should have fatty fish. So can you yeah. talk about how that's all tied together? Yeah. Uh, so if, if, you, if you listen to those people, you would think that you would have to be a bear during the salmon mating season and standing at the headwaters and just, oh, with your mouth and just keep eating fish by the tons. That's ridiculous. The brain it has more fat than the rest of the organs, yes, because of myelination and all of that. Which I have to say is, you know, it's not as accurate as people say. You know, they, they quote the number 70%, but when you look at, you know, the science, it, it's not that much. Yes, it is high in fat, but it's not that much because the water content has also been calculated. I digress. Continue. Yeah. I'm sorry. But, but as, no, that's a very important point. But, but as important, it's the fact that the brain needs fat but it gets fat. It doesn't need it any more than any other organ. In fact, it doesn't need any other fat except for omega-3s, mm -hmm. literally no other fat. Yeah. It has more than enough of its own fat coming, uh, the body gives, creates it, it has complete access to all the fat. And then here's the other thing about the brain. The brain doesn't need to store fat. In fact, it doesn't have the mechanism of storing fat. It just needs structural fat. And structural fat is a lot easier to get from, from the, uh, the body. And our body makes enough cholesterol that actually is used to maintain the infrastructure of the brain. We don't need extra cholesterol from our diet uh, or anywhere else to maintain that beautiful infrastructure. Like Dean said, omega-3 fatty acids are the only ones that we need on a regular basis. But we can get that from plants, minus all the contaminants in the ocean from fish. We can get that from flax seeds, from chia seeds, from walnuts, from kale. And you know, we've talked about this significantly, uh, Robbie. When, when we consume uh, plant-based uh, omega-3 fatty acids in the form of um, alpha-linoleic acid, and we keep the inflammatory foods down and we keep our saturated uh, fats down, the absorption is higher. But for people who have some trouble, you know, maintaining that balance, it, it's, it's okay to actually consider taking a little more omega-3 fatty acids in your food to make sure that you kind of cover for that deficit. And this is another topic we've talked about in the past, but I, I want to cover it again because I think it's so important. If somebody is just really their concern, they're just really questions, oh, I'm just not sure. I don't, I'm not sure I'm getting enough, you know, EPA and DHA for my brain health. Are there any tests or, 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 or like um, blood work they could do to assess and, and reassure themselves that they're okay? There are. Um, uh, the, there were questions as far as validity of those tests, but that's okay. Like, you gotta take it for what it is. But reality is the correlation between those tests and brain quantities and brain reserve and brain uh, efficiency is not strong. So we don't have good evidence for that. So if you're worried about omega-3, which you shouldn't if you're eating a planned plant-based diet, would focus on uh, you know the uh, chia and flaxseed and things of that nature, because of all the foods, flaxseed and chia have, are one of the few foods that have a higher ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. In a world where we have foods that have like thousands of times more omega-6 to omega-3, we have foods like chia and flaxseed, which are perfect proteins, and they are an um, uh, amazing source of omega-3. Um, uh, uh, or you can also get Aisha's muff, uh, the, 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 the recipe for omega, for the muffins. omega muffins, which are, which are amazing. Paid, that was a self-promotion. I, I paid him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> she actually made some last night, so they're great. But no, but the reality is that. But let's say even beyond that, and we just did a, a review, which, uh, which was submitted, <laughs> waiting for a while now for I it to know, be published. Yeah. But, it, uh, you know, omega-3 in the developing brain and omega-3 uh, in the aging brain. Yeah, at the, at two, though, though, in those two ends of spectrum of age, you need more omega-3. So if you're worried, take supplements. We're not against it. We don't have good data as far as measurement. We don't have good data as far as measurement and its outcome in the brain. And we do know that they're important. So if you're worried, just take an algae-based omega-3 and it's fine. And, and those people who are fighting over it on the internet, 
just sit back and watch them. We, we next you you're going straight to the source. You're going um, to basically source. where the yeah. fish got it, got that nutrition. Exactly. Anyway. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay, so you guys talked about lifestyle that it's beyond just nutrition. So how does exercise impact brain health? Exercise is incredibly important. And I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about other lifestyle factors as well. I mean, food is incredibly important. You know, it's basically um, you're creating your internal environment with food. But um, when it comes to healthy populations, those who have avoided dementia and particularly Alzheimer's, they, um, they maintain a healthy lifestyle altogether, which means they eat well, but at the same time, they are physically active. They manage their stress very well. They pay attention to their sleeping patterns and they keep their minds active throughout their life. As far as exercise is concerned, you know, we always knew that it was important for better cardiovascular health, but it's incredibly important for brain health. When we exercise, our body creates these growth hormones, um, particularly brain derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF. And this BDNF is like, you know, just a it, it's a pumping juice, you know, it really increases the connections between the existing brain cells. And it also improves blood flow, it increases the kinds of hormones that are associated with feeling of well being, whether it's serotonin or endorphins dopamine. and dopamine. Um, and so altogether, what happens is we create more connections between brain cells, which result in better brain reserve and cognitive resilience later on. It causes the removal of byproducts easily because of better circulation. And it also grows parts of our brain. There have been studies that show that when people engage in, you know, say strength training exercises, especially those that are focused on your legs, the part of the brain hippocampus actually grows literally and these were adults who already had some mild cognitive impairment and i think that's one of the most empowering messages out there showing us that even if people have some symptoms if they engage in exercise their brain literally grows why is this not news? Why is it not news? Because there's no money to be made. There's, <laughs> it's not being promoted by any company. Uh, but here is something that we have in our power to do to completely change the structure of our brain. And I think we should all do it and, and um, embrace it. In fact, one Harvard study showed that a, that a continue, continuous, consistent, brisk walk, 25 minutes brisk walk every, every day, reduces your chance of Alzheimer's by as much as 45%. Now imagine oh, if diet can reduce your risk by 53% and exercise can reduce it by 45%. I mean, the statistics doesn't work. You don't add it, but just, just look at how much power we have to prevent this devastating disease. And, and, and the beauty of exercise is we always start our program with exercise that it's at the, at, at the beginning because the reward is quicker. The, the outcome and behavior and reward, you know, that's, I'm a behavior neurologist. Um, uh, stimulus, behavior, reward, and it's named different names, but for exercise, that, that cycle is much quicker. You can get that dopamine release quicker. You can create a habit. And then once a habit is created, you can build on habits. It's called habit stacking. So it, exercise for multiple reasons, both intrinsically because of BDNF, vasculature blood and blood flow to the brain because you're moving uh, uh, because of um, uh, uh, all the other factors like dopamine. Oh, by the way, here's another thing. One of the best antidepressants is study after study or for anxiety or anxiety medicine is exercise. Yeah. So the, 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 the effect is just multifactorial. So everybody listening right now, go start walking, <laughs> bring your yes. computer with you, listen to this on your phone, like get that 40, you said 40 minute brisk walk? Yes, uh, no, 25 minutes. 25, 25, yeah, 25, yeah. okay. Yeah. I mean, I, we just got done talking with our friend Rich, and you don't have to do a Rich ultra Rock. marathon. I'm not gonna be doing any ultra marathons anytime soon. That, that would be great. For the rest of us mortals, 25 minutes of brisk walk is good enough. <laughs> That's great. Yeah.